All right, so here we're going to talk about asbestosis. Asbestosis is uh, actually one of the occupational lung diseases. Uh, it could be classified as that. A lot of these patients are a little bit older because asbestos was something that people were exposed to, particularly in the 1960s and 1970s, before we had uh, government regulations here in the U.S. Uh, limiting the use of asbestos. It used to be used as a flame retardant. Um, chronic exposure to asbestos increases the risk of different lung cancers. Uh, so you'll want to be aware of this. Uh, we don't see it so much anymore as perhaps we may have seen 20 years ago, uh, but you still see those commercials on TV every so often for uh, people that may have been exposed to asbestos in various careers. So uh, we will talk about uh, some other environmental and occupational lung diseases in another section, but I think asbestosis deserves its own treatment because uh, it's rather unique. So asbestosis is one of the pneumoconiases, uh, which also include coal workers pneumoconiasis and silicosis. Those will be addressed separately. We're going to talk about asbestosis in particular here because it is relatively common and has got some very significant sequelae. Uh, despite it being relatively common, the occurrence is decreasing, uh, so it, it will be, uh, ultimately it should be somewhat rare in the future, uh, but we still do see it. It was used in, uh, asbestos was a flame retardant, an insulator that was used in buildings primarily uh, during, uh, after the Industrial Revolution and up until uh, the 1970s when it was uh, found to be a, uh, a dangerous material that was associated with pulmonary disease. Even though it was used in buildings between 1877 and 1967, that doesn't mean you can't be exposed to it now. It just means that it was used up until 1967. So there are still buildings now that have asbestos. It's fewer and fewer, but um, they're, 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 they still are there. So there's still, uh, there still people uh, in different industries that may be exposed to asbestos. And so uh, that's uh, something that's important to know. Where is asbestos used? It's used in uh, primarily in, in building materials, so spray products, floor tiles, insulating products, asbestos, cement, and so forth. Uh, asbestosis is an occupational lung disease, so different occupations are going to be susceptible more than others, so insulation installers, boiler makers, pipe fitters, plumbers, and janitors. Asbestosis has a 20-year latency, so we're still seeing cases of asbestosis now uh, because people who are developing asbestosis now were exposed to it in, uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, smoking increases the risk of asbestos-related complications, namely cancer. So it increases the risk of uh, non-small cell lung cancer, which is the most common malignancy associated with uh, asbestosis, and mesothelioma, which is a, uh, a unique cancer that's primarily associated with asbestosis. The most common presenting symptom is dyspnea and a dry cough, and that's relatively nonspecific because that's a common presenting symptom for pretty much all of the restrictive interstitial lung diseases. So the most important thing that you're going to have in asbestosis is uh, a history, and you should have uh, a history of occupational exposure. So uh, a patient who uh, has been advised that they may have been exposed to asbestos or a patient that fits one of those occupations, such as insulation worker, boiler maker, and so forth, uh, that's, that's obviously not a comprehensive list, but uh, those are some of the common ones. Or patients who live in an old house. Uh, now it's not so common. Uh, most uh, most people uh, have had asbestos removed from their house if it uh, already uh, ex had existed, and none of the newer houses since built since the 1970s uh, have asbestos anymore. The symptoms, as mentioned, are dyspnea and a dry cough. You can have some chronic chest pain, and that's probably just due to the constant coughing and the difficulty breathing. On physical exam, you can hear fine rails, 
particularly in the lower and posterior lung areas. Uh, you can see some signs of cyanosis in some more progressed patients, and that would be uh, particularly finger clubbing. You may see pursed breathing, uh, which is just an adaptative uh, behavior where the patient uh, curves their lips in such a way that allows them to get uh, a better flow of oxygen. How do we diagnose asbestosis? Primarily, it's a clinical diagnosis. However, we do need to have imaging, and that imaging primarily surrounds uh, the chest x-ray. So that is the best initial test, and primarily, uh, I mean, namely, we should be able to get uh, certain findings that will point us towards asbestosis. It's going to be your history that's really going to narrow down your patients, and then having that chest x-ray is going to be not necessarily definitive, but it's going to give you uh, a pretty good idea whether or not the patient has asbestosis or not. So what do we see in patients with asbestosis? We see a bilateral pleural thickening, which appears often as a linear opacity. We can see diaphragmatic pleural plaques. That's uh, very unique to asbestosis. And then uh, infiltrates. CT has a better sensitivity, as always, than chest x-ray. And in advanced disease, it may show a honeycombing pattern. So you should consider getting a high-resolution CT in patients that have a history that's suggestive of asbestosis, but their chest x-ray doesn't show any signs of uh, what we would expect to see in asbestosis. Uh, so go for a chest x-ray first if you have no findings of asbestosis, but a history that's suggestive, then get a CT. And, um, and the radiologist will be able to tell you uh, if, if the patient has asbestosis. Don't worry about being able to, uh, to diagnose asbestosis on, uh, on CT. What you should know with asbestosis and any interstitial lung disease is that as it advances, uh, they all ultimately lead to this honeycombing pattern. The most accurate test for asbestosis is biopsy, but this is rarely, if ever, used in real life. But it is the most accurate test. Pulmonary function tests should show a restrictive pattern, decrease in, uh, in lung volumes across the board, and your diffusion of carbon dioxide, if you do that exam, will show a reduced diffusion. And that's just because of the interstitial nature uh, of this disease. The major differential diagnosis for asbestosis is idiopathic fibrosing interstitial pneumonia, which is formerly known as interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Patients with interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, or IFIP, uh, they, one, this is a uh, diagnosis of exclusion. So we would have to exclude asbestosis. Uh, so primarily the way we're going to do this is um, the patient would not have asbestos exposure. So we get some of the same kind of patterns and presentation with IFIP, but with IFIP, the patient will generally not have asbestos exposure or have questionable asbestos exposure. Another thing with IFIP is that it tends to affect the upper parts of the lungs, whereas asbestosis tends to affect the middle, lower middle parts of the lungs, and IFIP has a more rapid progression. IFIP is a heterogeneous group of disorders. Um, that will be addressed in a different section, but it is a diagnosis of exclusion. So we have to rule out all of the other causes of restrictive uh, interstitial lung diseases before we can diagnose IFIP. So things like sarcoidosis, histiocytosis, TB, tumor, fungal infection, uh, collagen vascular disease, environmental uh, pathogens, occupational diseases, and drugs. Okay, this is a normal chest x-ray. And this is a patient with asbestosis. So some of the findings that we see here are the pleural thickening. So we have some pleural thickening here. Notice how it's linear. And then we have what appears to be a little bit of pleural thickening here, but it's not as prominent. Now, as the patient goes on and their asbestosis gets worse as they get more infiltrates, you're not going to see that pleural thickening as well because 
right now we're looking at it at a, at a relatively healthy background. So it's easy to see that early pleural thickening, but as you develop more infiltrates, it's going to kind of blend in with the rest of the infiltrates. We also have some diaphragmatic calcifications, and what you're basically looking at is you're looking at the base uh, of the lung, at the, the, the diaphragm here, and you see these little calcifications. We see two of them, maybe a third one right here. Sometimes you can also see them on the, on the, the chest wall. And this is early asbestosis. All right, so what have we got here? We've got some diaphragmatic calcifications on both sides here. Possibly another one here. And then we've got reticulonodular, reticulonodular infiltrates. And basically all that is is, uh, is the asbestos causing inflammation in the uh, lung parenchyma. And this is ultimately what leads to the uh, symptoms of asbestos exposure, which are the, uh, the hypoxia and uh, the dyspnea and so forth, since we're going to get uh, a decreased diffusion of oxygen. So these reticulonodular infiltrates, uh, like anything in asbestos exposure, when you see it in the lungs, it's mostly going to be towards the bottom. We don't see a whole lot at the top. You can, I mean, you got some of them, probably this one here and this one, but it's going to be more affected at the bottom. So uh, here's one, here's one, here's one. Uh, there's a lot of them. And uh, so here's another patient. So here's some pleural thickening, but because we've got some, uh, some reticulonodular, reticulonodular infiltrates, my tongue's getting tied here, uh, we, we don't see the pleural thickening as prominently as we did in that first one. So you can see some sort of linear uh, paths here. So this is probably pleural thickening. Uh, but this patient is obviously much more progressed than that first one. And we have some diaphragmatic calcifications very clearly here. The diaphragmatic calcifications are uh, a lot more specific for asbestos than uh, the pleural thickening. And then some reticulonodular infiltrates, not as clearly seen as on the other one. Okay, and this is a patient with much more advanced asbestos exposure. So uh, you can see probably some thickening here. You can see some... Uh, some calcifications there. Uh, so, all right, uh, this is a CT in a patient with advanced uh, interstitial lung disease. So that could be anything, sarcoidosis, it could, be, uh, it could be collagen vascular disease, it could be any of the environmental diseases. This is just a patient with advanced interstitial lung disease. It could also be advanced asbestosis too. So this honeycombing is just this pattern of, uh, of large uh, holing here and that's just due to the uh, inflammatory process I'm not a radiologist <laughs> okay and here here you see it some more so know what honeycombing looks like but you're never going to be given uh, something like this and asked what's the disease because this can be representative of any of the interstitial lung diseases at the end stage Okay, so treat, treating asbestosis, what do we do? Well, uh, there's really no definitive treatment. There's nothing that can be done to reverse asbestosis. Once the damage is done, it's done. So the therapy is going to be palliating the uh, symptoms and uh, then expectant therapy uh, for some of the complications that may come up. So once a patient has been diagnosed with asbestos, they should get an ABG analysis. If their oxygenation is low, uh, then they should be given uh, given supplemental oxygen for home use. Ultimately, most patients with asbestosis are going to need supplemental oxygen for home use. Pulmonary function tests should be done uh, just to get a baseline of where they're at as far as their lung volumes. The 23-valent pneumococcal and annual influenza vaccination should be given. That's to decrease complications. Remember that pneumonia, influenza, they both affect the lungs. So uh, we want to prevent them from getting that, if possible, uh, just because uh, having that can worsen their asbestosis permanently. So they should get uh, all. They should be totally vaccinated for uh, those two.
regular follow-up, of course, and then smoking cessation. Uh, this is for two reasons. Uh, so any patient that may be exposed to uh, asbestos should stop smoking because if you're exposed to asbestos, the fibers you're going to need to be able to ex expectorate them out. So what I'm trying to uh, make a point of is that smoking is correlated both with the development of asbestosis as well as the uh, the symptoms of asbestosis. So if you're a uh, if if you worked as a pipe fitter and you were smoking while you were exposed to the asbestos, you have a much higher likelihood of developing uh, asbestosis because smoking reduces your ability to expectorate the asbestos fibers. Also, if you have asbestosis and you're smoking, that is a problem because it increases your risk of developing cancer. So smoking should stop, uh, well, in any patient, but particularly in patients with lung diseases like asbestos. Education should be provided regarding complications like mesothelioma and respiratory infections, and then patients should be given resources for social and legal compensation. We all know that there's a lot of law firms that are just vulturing to, uh, to profit off of these patients, but certainly patients should be directed towards the appropriate uh, resources. Um, most uh, state and federal agencies will be able to help patients with asbestosis who were exposed to the asbestos on the job. So that uh, can entitle them to some uh, compensation for their medical fees. And the complications with asbestosis are those related to any of the interstitial lung diseases. So our core pulmonale, pulmonary hypertension, and right heart failure. And those three are just kind of interrelated. So uh, if, if you have pulmonary hypertension, it's going to lead to right heart failure. Chronic right heart failure leads to enlargement. And so those things are all complications of uh, any of the interstitial lung diseases. Malignancy. Uh, is uh, associated with asbestosis, particularly if the patient is a smoker. Non-small cell lung cancers, the bronchogenic carcinomas are the number one cancer that uh, is associated with asbestosis. So what we're looking at there is, uh, is adenocarcinoma and squamous cell lung cancer. Mesothelioma is also associated with asbestosis, and that's a very particular lung cancer that is associated with asbestosis. So the most common cancer that you're going to see in patients with asbestosis is the non-small cell lung cancers. However, mesothelioma is a uh, cancer that it, uh, almost always shows up in patients who are exposed to asbestos. So even though we correlate mesothelioma to asbestos, mesothelioma is not the most common cancer uh, to show up in uh, patients with uh, exposure to asbestos. That would be the non-small cell lung cancers. And then respiratory insufficiency can be a, a problematic complication as well. That's primarily addressed by supplemental oxygen.